Welcome. This video was recorded live on World Sake Day, October 1st, 2020. It is a replay of one of the many sake presentations and panels that were live streamed at Sake Day USA, an online sake festival and fundraiser benefiting the American Sake Association, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. The purpose of our nonprofit is to develop approachable and easy to understand sake education materials as well as to provide affordable access to sake tastings and interactive events. If this presentation was of value to you, please consider a tax-deductible donation to the American Sake Association. To donate, please scan the QR code on the screen or visit our website at americansakeassociation.org. Thank you. Enjoy the video and come by. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. We've got a a really interesting discussion that we're excited to have with you. My name is Brian. I'm Brandon. Happy Sake Day. Happy Sake Day. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, today I'm going to, I have two things I'm going to do. I'm going to try and figure out how to switch share screen. Oh, I did it. I'm going to share this screen. I have to, Don't be overconfident. I know. I have to do What else I have to do? Share. I have to use the button. Okay. Share my screen. Um, okay, so it's just more uh, seminar-like, <laughs> um, but today I want to talk about um, uh, citric acid-producing kojis and, and how you might involve those in sake brewing. So this talk is a little bit about science. Um, I've got some examples of sakes that involve citric acid koji. Um, we're going to talk about food a little bit, and then I'm going to end on... Um, some resources, so if, if you are just a cook at home and you wanna uh, involve citric acid koji in your, in your hobby, um, I've got some resources for that. So, so I, I know probably the whole crowd knows this, um, but let's just review what koji is. So koji is obviously an ingredient in sake. It's responsible for some of the flavor and aroma of, of uh, the final sake, and most importantly, it's where the enzymes come from uh, that make fermentation in sake possible. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about amylases in this. So, koji is a fungus, um, and it's in the family uh, Aspergillus. So, Aspergillus is a huge family of organisms. Um, it's, it has food and beverage and industrial uses around the world, but today we're just gonna talk about three kinds of koji. So I'm gonna talk about the difficult names first and then I'm gonna make them easy, all right? So, so the first koji we have of, of our three is Aspergillus orizae. There's also Aspergillus luchuensis. Um, that's a new name, the old name was Aspergillus awamori. So if you see awamori, just know that it's also this luchuensis. And then there's a mutant of this koji called Aspergillus luchuensis uh, kawachi. So this is a, an oversimplification and, and not a complete list, but, but uh, orize is what's used mainly for sake and amazake. Luchuensis is what's used in awamori. You can see where its old name came from. And then kawachi is what's used in shochu. So here are the easy names now. So this koji for sake is yellow koji, and I can't see half my screen. Um, uh, the koji for awamori is black koji, and I'm gonna try and get rid of that, yeah, just minimize it. Maybe I can't see my mouse. Hang on, a little technical. Oh, no. I can't see my mouse. Okay, get, sorry, one second. Oh, oh, I messed up. We're on yellow. Three okay. Four. Anyway, I'll just guess what's over there. I went through this a few times. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so Aromori is black, and then Shochu is white. Um, so where do those color names come from? Well, you would think that yellow would look yellow, and it kind of does. This is the Koji Tane that we use a lot uh, here. Um, comes off kind of green to me. When you grow it, um, it's white. Uh, black koji is true to its name. Um, it definitely looks black. You can barely even see the rice in there. Um, and then white koji is the trickster in that it is brown. Um, so sometimes you will see it actually called brown koji. 
um, uh, but those are interchangeable. Um, and then I've also heard that the names come from how, well, the colors when they're growing on petri dishes. And okay, I'll say maybe black and white, that's true, but I don't know. If in chat you know where yellow got its name, put it in chat. <laughs> Um, so for this talk, we're interested in black and white koji. These aren't traditionally used in, in sake making. Um, and these are the ones that make a lot of citric acid. Um, so, so, um, so why do they make citric acid? Well, the answer is that's just what they do. Um, <laughs> um, the, the better question is, is why did shochu and amamori, why did those processes uh, you know, gravitate towards those? Why did those co-evolve? And this is a massive oversimplification of shochu making. Um, but basically, you, you have black or white koji that brings the citric acid and water and yeast. And when you add acid to something, you lower the pH, right? So, so when you lower the pH, you lock out the bad bacteria. Um, and that's a good thing because bad bacteria will either kill the yeast or mess up the fermentation or it will add uh, like off flavors to your final product. So, so here's a question. If we put so much citric acid uh, into our shochu or awamori, why, why doesn't shochu just taste super sour? And, and the answer is because we distill it. And in the distillation process, we keep the aromas, we keep the alcohol, but the citric acid stays behind. Um, in sake, we don't distill, we press the sake. So any citric acid you put into the maromi is gonna end up in the final sake. Um, so let's talk about why uh, citric acid, why involving black and white koji might be a good thing um, in, in sake. Um, so sake is, is uh, low in acid, but we can say that lactic acid is kind of a major player uh, among those acids. So if you think about some of the foods and beverages that are lactic acid forward, um, you have things like yogurt or kimchi, as opposed to citric acid, which obviously is citrus, you know, things like tomato, uh, wine is you know, more citric acid forward um, than, than sake. Um, and I, to, to my palate, like citric acid is just more tart. Like there's a difference between eating kimchi and like biting into a lemon. Um, so, so black and white koji can give you a greater overall acidity in sake. Um, traditionally that's sort of looked down upon. Um, uh, but you know, there's sort of a trend now to have higher acidity, acidity sakes that maybe pair with food differently. And definitely if, if you're a Psalm and you're trying to attract wine drinkers, having a sake that's got black or white koji involved with it might be something to, to turn them on to. Um, and then if you're pairing foods, you know, um, you can get maybe better or different food pairings with something um, that's involved black and white koji. And then I've got added complexity here. So I can think of a few ways to bring black or white koji into the normal yellow koji sake making process. One is to replace a small amount of, of the yellow koji with, say, white koji. Um, and you're just bringing up the citric acid a little bit and you're blending it with the acid background of the lactic acid. I feel like that that can bring uh, more complexity to a drink. Um, another way you could bring it in is you could replace all of the yellow sake koji with say white and you're gonna get like just a sour bomb sake. And, and if, you're, if you're somebody who's making sake and, and you want to have kind of a breadth of, of things to offer to people, you know, it's an outlier and it's a novelty, but, but that might be something um, uh, that you want. And finally, um, in this, I've got a question mark here about better shelf life, but in our hands, um, you know, we make, uh, uh, we've, we've had a few tries of something we call koji sour, where we replace some of the yellow koji with white koji. And even as a nama nama, like sitting in the back library where it's warm, it just seems to have a really good shelf life. It just really kind of hangs in there. Um, so, so um, I just wanted to put up a few examples of, of commercial sakes that involve black or white koji. Um, and if, you, if you're aware of some more, please put them in chat. But uh, Aramasa has a sparkling, I think it's a daiginjo, um, that uh, to some degree involves white koji. Um, Dan out of Oakland, um, he's got a Blanc 
um, which I haven't tried. I haven't tried any of Dan's sake yet, uh, which involves white koji. Um, and then Fuku Masamune has a Junmai, which I, uh, has a small amount of black koji, I think. Uh, so um, let's talk about uh, like the differences between growing yellow koji, which we're real familiar with, and um, growing something like white koji. Uh, um, we've only ever grown white koji here. I haven't grown black koji yet. Um, but for yellow koji, our normal sake koji, um, this is a graph of the time in the koji room versus the temperature. So we bring our steamed rice in and we inoculate it with yellow koji. And then we proceed to keep it warm and then the organism starts producing heat on its own and it starts over two days, it gets warmer and warmer. And it passes through these zones uh, where, where enzymes are sort of emphasized. Um, the first zone is protease, and that's responsible for like more uh, bigger taste, more umami. <clears throat> and then finally towards the end, we get amylase. So amylase is the enzyme that brings the sugar. Um, uh, so that, that's, amylase is important for a healthy fermentation. And so we kind of mess with this temperature profile depending on what kind of sake we're making. If we want something with a big taste, we might hang out in that protease phase area longer. And then if we're doing, we want something like a light genjo or, or a dai genjo, we'll kind of zip up to that amylase pretty quickly and, and like leave the umami behind. So white koji is a trip in that the temperature profile is sort of inversed. You bring it in, you get it a little warm, and then you proceed to cool it down in steps until you enter this, this, uh, this sort of citric acid magic zone. And that's where all the citric acid is made. And then if, if there are other brewers listening um, just in, in our hands, uh, how, how, what the experience we've had with growing with uh, different kojis, white koji, is that white koji grows more weakly than yellow koji. So you need to use a lot more tane than you would um, say Haiji or, or other yellow kojis. You also have to consider that as a contamination risk. Um, uh, you know, you don't want the spores from white or black koji hanging out when you're just trying to make an, a, like a non-citric koji. So you gotta clean your koji room. And then uh, Higuchi-san, who we get a lot of our uh, 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 koji tane from, um, he's communicated to me that like, I should be careful with black koji because it's tenacious. I think particularly if you've got wood in your, in your koji room, you might just have black koji forever. So uh, I would be careful with that. Um, so um, I'm just going to plug Brian Ashcraft's new book because it's a great book. Um, and I just got it recently. Um, and so remember I was saying that like you could make a, a, a sort of a novelty sake where you replace all of the yellow koji with white or black koji. And, and I haven't done that, but I suspect it would be very, very sour. Um, so it turns out uh, uh, Ikikame has a sake where they have replaced all of the yellow koji with black koji, which I believe is even more citric forward than white koji. Um, yet it's not a sour bomb. Um, and I can't even read um, the, the quotes here because it's covered up. But, but the, this is the president of the, of the brewery, and he's saying that like, if you hold back the acidity, there's a chance that the enzyme balance might collapse and you won't get a healthy fermentation. So he's saying that um, you need real precise control of your humidity um, uh, and temperature with that. And, and, and so it got me thinking, and I think what they're doing at this brewery, if I go back, is I think that they're doing the same thing we do with yellow koji, where we play with the temperatures to adjust the enzymes. I think they're doing that with white koji. Um, and, and they're like maybe limiting the time that they're in that citric acid zone to get a, like a more balanced um, uh, sake. So um, anyway, I just think that's a real elegant approach to, to bringing black koji into something. And I, I imagine that must take years of, of puzzling out to. Um, to figure out. Okay, so we're gonna do one last sciencey thing, um, and then we'll end with some uh, uh, resources for, for maybe uh, growing koji at home. Um, so that last sake made me remember this research paper um, 
which, which tells us that there are actually two kinds of amylase. Um, yellow koji makes what's called an acid unstable amylase. Um, white and black make that acid unstabilized, uh, uh, unstable amylase, but they also make an acid stable amylase. If you think about it, since white and black, black koji are making so much citric acid, that's important for the organism to get its food. Um, so this, this just brought up questions for me that I don't have the answers to. Um, but if you think of a spectrum of, of pHs, um, where lower pH, more acid on one end, and higher pH, less acid, more, more like regular sake, uh, like, I'm just curious, do the acid-stable amylase, amylases only work down at the low end, and the unstable ones work at the, at the upper end? Um, is, do they cross over? Is there sort of a sweet spot? Um, so in the times that we've made incorporated uh, white koji into um, uh, our normal sake process, you know, I've done it where the first and second edition use white koji, and then I bring in normal sake koji. Um, and and that's, that's, it's amazing because when you do miso koji, the first edition, the pH is, that's very, very low pH. Um, but this, this method turns out to have a real uh, uh, healthy fermentation and we ended up where we want to. Um, so I don't know, if, if you're going to brew with this, I just think it's something to think about uh, if you incorporate black or white koji. Um, and I, I think making sake outside of Japan, uh, sometimes you think you're stumbling across something new or you have a new concept, but we're probably reinventing the wheel and there's probably papers um, in, the, in the Brewing Society of Japan that like talks all about this, but it's new to us. Okay, so I want to finish by um, talking about a couple books. Um, probably many of us have seen this Noma Guide to Fermentation. I think this got a lot of people into, into koji around the world, especially chefs. Um, recently, Rich and Jeremy put out this great book. And both of these books uh, uh, um, you know, dedicate a little portion to talking about black and white koji. Um, they also have resources about where you can buy um, the supplies you might need uh, that like, you don't have to buy like a brewery size amount of tane. Um, and then lastly, I want to mention uh, this book, which is new. Um, you can pick it up on Amazon or your non-corporate bookstore if you want. Um, but uh, Nakaji, uh, he's put out a, just a simple little guide to make, to make small amounts of koji at home. Um, and he's got like, like a real good pictures of step-by-step uh, -step, um, ways to do that. So uh, if, if you look at any of these resources, you can at least cook or make sake at home. So um, I didn't have time to go in as deep as I wanted to, but, but if anybody has questions, they can email me at brandon at brooklynkura.com. And now we're going to try and figure out how to stop sharing the screen. I know I see it. I can't see my mouse. Oh, we did it. No, you didn't. No. You just clicked on the screen. Oh, there we go. Nicely done, buddy. Oh, right, thanks. Uh, very well done. And also, you very proud of you were able to stop sharing your screen and, and get through the whole key, uh, keynote on your own. Uh, <laughs> there are a couple of questions in the chat that were great. One of them you just answered about Koji, but John Puma has a question uh, for you that, that yeah, somebody some, asked. So somebody else in the chat had, had asked uh, a question, not specifically about the Koji, but... Um, with regard to number 14, um, they're asking if they should be opening it soon or if it's something that would be interesting to age. Uh, oh, or our, our, our Ginjo number 14. Uh, <laughs> the answer is both. Uh, there's a lot of, we've had a lot of uh, people uh, start aging our namas. Um, hmm. and we do a little bit of that here. Um, so yeah, they change with time and particularly how you store them, like at what temperature. Um, and you know they 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 go through an evolution, which is you know pretty cool to experience. Nice, awesome. So the other question you actually answered uh, it came up in the chat, but you answered it in your fantastic presentation about util utilization of multiple kojis. Uh, so uh, Tony got his his question answered. Uh, so that's fantastic. Oh yeah. Uh, that. So. With your experience of now playing around with these these different kojis, you know, without possibly black at the moment, 
are you happy with the results? Is this something you want to continue playing with? Is this something fun that will get into spring sakes or different releases during the year where you want more citrus? Yeah, I mean, we're playing around, like, particularly with white koji in a variety of ways. Um, like, if you come into the tap room, um, you can taste koji sour, and that's obviously got some citric as uh, aspect to it. Um, but we're working it into things we hope to release eventually. Yeah, Chris, I'd say one of the, one of the reasons why we started Curricin, the subscription service, is really so that we can do that small batch kind of experimentation and 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 present it to some of our our best and and most engaged customers. And so you'll definitely see next year some riffs um, with different like combinations of koji coming out through Curricin. Um, and that's a way for us to also get real time feedback and think about whether or not we need to need or want to make something larger scale for, for distribution. Awesome. Um, a quick question that just rolled in, which level of acidity are you aiming for? Uh, like when it's not quite wine acidity, but are you trying to get that high or where is your goal in that sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think like we're doing a lot of experimenting. So we're seeing where things go and, and figuring that out. Um, and we're going to an acidity level that we, we like yeah. and, then, and, then, and like people that come in like. So we, we, don't, we don't like, uh, put any real constraints on it. Awesome. Um, um, I see two glasses in front yeah. of you. I mean, I'm guessing that's for, that's so, for us to compile. Are you going to tell us a little yeah, bit? So, about so, so, so we'll compile. I mean, we we just um, are starting to prepare some bottles for the next three months of Curricin because of our friends um, in Minnesota, Blake Richardson. Uh, um, uh, we were able to get access to some Omachi. Um, and so in the coming months, we're going to be um, uh, sharing with Kirkin and then on our, our website in our tap room, um, a 100% omachi sake, um, and that's koji and kakumai. So we're going to have a, a sip of that, um, and we can say kumpai together. Yeah, so this is omachi from Isbell Farms in Arkansas. Um, and then we used a real neutral yeast to try and uh, bring out bring out the, like we want to get to know American Omachi. So this is the first time we've brewed with American Omachi. Come so, by guys. So come by. Come by everybody. Well, hold on. Come by before we're ready. Oh, mm. sorry, so we can do a I was set. ready. We have a lot. I knew that. You were <laughs> ready, Chris. What are you talking oh, about? Nice. Cheers, cheers. Come by. I mean, I, I emptied my glass so I could drink Brooklyn Curra stuff okay. and then you <laughs> ran ahead of me. Anyway, again, thank you both very much for sharing this information with us. Uh, these guys make some really, really fantastic sake right here in New York. Um, obviously, you can tell by the conversation, they're, they're experimenting, they're creating new things, they're not just making ginjo, they're doing dai ginjos, they have super fun sparkling sakes, you can taste the moromi, you can actually enjoy a um, couple times a year a slightly hopped kind of rosé-ass sake. So this is a really, really wonderful uh, brewery, we appreciate your time, uh, thank you for joining us, and, and as always, happy sake day. Happy, happy sake day. Thank you. Happy guys. sake day. Thanks, guys. Come